Welcome back to the drawing board with me Stephen Lloyd and today we are talking about bolted connections between beams and columns. Now there are lots of different components in this bolted connection that are pulling, pushing, twisting, shearing and the idea is you've got to check every single one of those components because the whole joint will fail when the weakest link fails. So we're going to go through a quick short list of these uh, for instance bolt tension, the bolts at the top will be in tension the end plate or the flange, so the end plate attached to the beam or the flange attached to this column here, they may actually bend with the tension. You're looking at the tension in the web as well, so behind that flange or end plate, you may tear the web here and here, so you've got to check the strength of that web as well. The end plate welds are important because there's no point bolting that end plate to the column and that plate staying there if the rest of the beam that's attached to it falls away because the welds fail. Then you have either the beam flange or the column web in compression. So at the bottom here, you've got tension at the top and in the bottom here we have compression. And we have to check that the column web here and that the beam flange here are both capable of taking that compression because you'll have just as much compression at the bottom of the joint as you have tension at the top of the joint here. Next we'll be looking at the panel shear in this web panel here. So you have a, a force at the bottom and an opposite force at the top and those two forces coming across each other they will cause a shear force in the web. And then you're looking at bolt shear and bolt bearing. So that's the bearing inside the hole of this bolt and then the shear strength of the actual shaft of the bolt and see if that can take the weight of what's on this beam pressing down. So this all applies to moment resisting joints and the way to design these is listed in Eurocode 3 part 1 part 8 but in my opinion an even better document is the SCI BCSA joint publication P398 and that basically gives you a step-by-step -step guide to all of these and how to calculate each one with all the equations and loads of clever diagrams uh, so if you're going to try anything I would give that a good read because that will tell you exactly how to do all of this stuff so this is just going to be a high level overview of all of the different things you have to consider so coming back to bolt tension, end plate and flange bending, and web tension, the important thing here is what they call a T-stub. So it's either, if you imagine the web of this column and its associated flange, or this web of the beam here and the end plate that's welded to it. If you look in plan on that, what you'll see is a shape, kind of like a T. And there are different ways that that T-stub can fail. Mode one is entirely the bending failure of the end plate or the column flange. It could happen at either side. So for each of these, you check in the right side and you check in the left side separately. So that's entirely a failure of the flange. So it bends twice here and here, or in the top case here, here and here. So the bolts, it doesn't matter how strong the bolts are, if the plate behind the bolts fails, then the joint has failed. The second is a combination between the bolts and the plate failing. So the plate has bent and it causes prying, which is actually snapping these bolts. So that's a bit of a combination between failure of the plate and of the bolts. And the third failure, which is the easiest to calculate because you just add up the tensile resistances of every bolt you're talking about, that is just the bolt snapping. And I say it's important for web tension as well, because how much of this plate you are involving in the whole process will determine how much width of web behind that plate will also be involved. And this is what we call the effective length of these failure modes. And you have circular modes and you have non-circular modes and you have to check them both. So you can see why this is quite a high level overview. If I went into detail on all of these, I could probably stand here for about three hours talking about it all because you have to check both sides. So that's two combinations. For each of these, that's two times these three combinations for circular and non-circular patterns. So already you're looking at something like 40 or 50 lines of calculation just to work out the resistance of this first set of three for one row of bolts. So it can take a long, long time to work out moment resisting connections. And this is why, generally speaking, a lot of structural engineers will do the global analysis of the building and will leave the connections to last or leave it to a subcontract designer. Coming past these first three and looking now at the compression rather than the tension, you're going to have to balance this tension at the top, we talked about the bolts and we talked about the web tearing, with compression at the bottom. And so you may get either a buckling failure of this flange here or just simply a compressive failure and you may get the failure of this flange of the beam. 
Now it's important that that compression at the bottom balances with the tension at the top. But not only that, you might be looking at a slightly different distribution of forces that means you can't get the complete tension resistance out of all of these bolts. So you've got two rules. The tension must be equal to the compression. So this flange and this web here must be able to take compression equal to the sum of all the tensions you've applied at the top. The second rule is that each of these tensions over the a distance from this compression flange will be equal or each one will be less than the one above. This is a mathematical way of expressing this triangular distribution. So if you imagine that the uh, point of rotation is this compression flange here, the three bolts above in this example, that proportion compared to that proportion compared to that proportion, it will make a triangle. This is very similar to something you'll recognize from previous drawing boards where we looked at the elastic distribution of stress in a beam and it's exactly the same except it's just half of that picture. So you can't get this bolt at the bottom exerting more force than the triangular distribution will allow because that would mean that you've gone into some kind of plastic resistance and you can't guarantee that you're going to get the strains that you require in order for those tensions to get to where you want them to be. Now the way you design it is quite generous to you in that any reductions that you have to make, for example, if these ones couldn't quite get the full tension, or if your compression, that you've designed the compression resistance of this flange or this web is actually smaller than the sum of the bolts, you will have to reduce the resistance of these bolts. But it lets you reduce the first one as the bottom bolt, and once you've got rid of that resistance, you'll have to start reducing the second bolt, which means that the bolt that you leave with the maximum resistance is the one at the top. The one that's furthest away and will therefore give you the best moment because the same strength times by a bigger moment, uh, times by a bigger distance will give you a better moment resistance. And what if your joint is still not strong enough? What if you've calculated all of this out and something fails? For example, your web fails in tension. Well, you can add strengthening and stiffeners. And there's four diagrams at the bottom here that show you all of those. A tension stiffener, it could be partial or it could be a full depth that will actually carry the tension from that flange to that flange without involving the web. And therefore your web's not gonna fail. Compression, so you could add a second uh, stiffener underneath at the compression zone and again it's the same principle it carries the compression forces from this flange to that flange and counteracts the idea of this web buckling or this web getting uh, yielding due to compression. Now what if it's not a compression failure what if it's a shear failure well you can have shear stiffeners as well so this is an example of one a K stiffener because the back flange and the two stiffeners there make the shape of the letter K or you could add a diagonal between two horizontal stiffeners, and that would be an end stiffener. And both of these carry the shear by converting that shear into direct axial force through these stiffeners. And again, they will strengthen the web of the column. The final way is to actually have a supplementary beam, a supplementary uh, plate welded to the web of the column. Now this will help you because it will not only increase the tension capacity, the compressive capacity, but also the shear capacity of that column. Now you notice one common theme through all of these is that it almost always tends to be the column that gets stiffened. And that's because when it comes to the beam, you've got the advantage of these two flanges acting axially. They make it quite strong in comparison to the column where it's quite easy to, to bend away that flange of the column or to break that web of the column. So in almost all circumstances, it ends up being this left hand side here that is the weaker of the two sides. So it gives you a very quick explanation of the ideas behind designing a bolted connection between a beam and a column. I've not got into too much detail because there is a sort of 100 page document that will run you through all the calculations. So I'll repeat again, have a look at P398. It's a fantastic design guide for doing these uh, kind of connections. And hopefully you understand now a little bit about the complexities of connection design. Uh, so I hope you will join us again on Back to the Drawing Board.